first of all, uh, welcome everyone and uh, thanks for uh, joining this, uh, uh, this workshop. This is the second uh, edition of the low code workshop at Models. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm one of the co organizers of this workshop. So I co organized this workshop together with uh, uh, Juan de Lara, the Mini Scholar of us, Massimo Dizzi, and Manuel Wigner. And uh, yeah, just to do a quick uh, uh, introduction about the context of this workshop. So first of all, we are we're going to talk about the low code development platforms. And uh, for those that uh, are not aware yet of, uh, of what low code means, I mean, if we if you quickly look at the Wikipedia, you can find this definition about uh, LSDP. And LSDP provides you know, a development environment used to create software applications by means of graphical user interfaces and configuration instead of uh, traditional uncoded computer programming and the usage of uh, local development platforms can be tracked back in 2014 uh, from uh, a forester that defined these platforms as again platforms that enable rapid delivery of applications with, uh, with the idea of minimizing the encoding and uh, uh, the minimal uh, reducing the upfront investment in setup, training the deployment of uh, business applications. So there are a number of pushing factors about low code. Uh, one of the main pushing factors is related to the increasing demand of software developers in Europe, and you can uh, find many numbers uh, um, predicting uh, the uh, forecasting. Uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the need, the increasing demand of software developers. No. Um, and there is the shortage of developers in Europe, and uh, uh, there are many numbers that uh, um, uh, assess this this fact. So uh, there is, a, if you also uh, look on Google and the search for local development platform, you see that uh, there is this Google trend. So there is the increase in the interest around this uh, this topic. So, and if there are many, many platforms, local development platforms, hundreds of them, but at the end, they all try to target citizen developers. So developers, I mean, users that are not, that do not have a, a strong programming skills, but they, that still need to, uh, to do some form of software development. And uh, um, how they target so citizen developers by providing uh, 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 graphical languages, drag and drop facilities, forms, configurations, in order to, I mean, make the development of applications faster. So just a, a quick uh, uh, open parenthesis. So this workshop is also uh, organized in the context of uh, an ITN project, uh, the EU, EU local mode project. And this is a, 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 an ETN, so innovative training network on the local codes. And uh, uh, we, are, we are training uh, 15 students, PhD students around this topic. And uh, uh, yeah, to become the leaders of tomorrow uh, uh, engineering of uh, local development platforms. Uh, yeah. What What about the agenda today? Um, we are. I mean, we uh, we are going to have uh, a keynote speaker from Evan Escott, and uh, I can really ask them Dimitris to present our keynote speaker. Um, and after the the keynote, we are going to have a short break, and then we have a, 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 the morning session that is going to be about uh, some experience reports in adopting and uh, using the local development platforms. And we're going to have the first uh, a first talk about analysis and. I mean, using uh, I mean, analysis and validation techniques in the context of uh, local development platforms. Then we do a longer break and we start again at four with, uh, uh, with the continuation of this session about also a local model management session and also about uh, development processes that make use of uh, local platforms. So now I kindly ask Dimitris if uh, he wants to present our uh, keynote speaker. Yep, uh, of course. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, today's keynote speaker, Dr. Iban Escott. Uh, Iban is the founder of CodeBots, which is a technology platform that helps developers create uh, custom software faster and better using model-driven engineering technologies. Uh, Iban holds a master and a PhD from the University of Queensland. And today he will talk to us about how low code, uh, how the low code movement can be the first step towards the realization of the vision of model driven engineering. So, uh, Ivan, over to you. Thank you. So, we'll stop sharing. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction and um, everybody listening in. Um, for all those people with their camera off, I'm not sure if you're doing your um, 
you're you're getting ready for your lectures or whatever it is, but this is actually going to be quite an interactive session. Um, so just be prepared. I'm going to be, um, yeah, so maybe switch. Thank you, Andreas, for switching your camera on. There's going to be a few uh, little interactions here. So I'm going to share my screen um, and I'm going to try for something. Now, I don't know if you guys have experimented with this in your lectures or your teaching or anything like that, but hopefully um, if any of the ideas I put across to you guys today, maybe try this with your students because I've found this a really good way to get um, the audience involved uh, when they're actually doing sessions. All right, so um, how does this work? Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to use an application called Menti. Uh, has anyone used Menti before? Yep, feel free to talk. Yes. Yep, got a few yeses. Uh, Menti yep. is awesome. Uh, so jump on to menti.com because I've got about um, seven or eight sort of things that I'm going to ask you guys to put uh, feedback into. Um, so if you jump on your browser, uh, jump to menti.com uh, and then it'll prompt you to put in a code. Uh, the code you put in is the one there uh, at the top, which is 77589741. So again, 7758-9741. Nine seven four one, uh, and Demetrius, what I'll do after this session is because it collects all the results. I'll share those with you, and you can push that out to everyone so they've got all the data as well. Um, all right, uh, that'd be great. Thank you very much. No worries, no worries. Okay, so low code, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, I love the title. That's the uh, I don't know if I'm a bit old school. That's the the uh, the Western with Clint Eastwood in it, uh, with the three characters going across there. So I thought that'd be a, a good title. Um, presenting um, today, uh, let me just move this out of the way so I can. Give me one second. Why is that not moving? I think it's something to do with the screen share. Sorry. JG, why is that not moving across? Technical help. Hmm. Sorry, gang. Oh, here we go. Just running really slow. Uh, all right, so agenda for today. Uh, we're going to look at low code. We're going to look at some tools and processes, some of my favorites. Uh, and then we're going to end up um, looking at a sneak preview. It's actually a world first, gang. I have not... Um, I've only shown a couple of people um, some of our new technologies and I figured I'm going to um, share it with everyone here today, which is going to be good fun. All right. First of all, what I want to start off by saying is that um, uh, we actually absolutely love model-driven engineering. Um, I fell in love with MDE uh, when I was working on my doctorate. Um, JG, who's here. JG, say hello to everyone. Um, who I met throughout my doctorate, pointed me in the direction. He's been doing MDE a lot longer than me. Um, and one of the things that I fell in love with very soon uh, was the fact as soon as you commit to everything being a model, so you start committing to those levels of abstraction and, and you commit to that in your software engineering process, so many amazing things happen. Uh, and I've met so many wonderful people on the journey of MDE. Uh, and, uh, and I think we all have this sort of shared understanding of the power of how far MDE can actually go, uh, which is pretty amazing. But we look at some of the, the grand challenges that we're facing uh, in the MDE community at the moment. And, you know, we talk about all the things that we're trying to do better. All right, so here's my first question uh, for the audience. Do you love low code? So I want to ask this question of everyone before I start talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, uh, better than sliced bread, throw it up on the, on the right-hand side there. Um, and then, like, down to the bottom end, not so much. I'd love to see where everyone sort of sits on this, on this sort of spectrum. 
20 votes. Very good. How many? Have we got about 20 people online, you reckon? We'll go with 20? 22? Uh, about 42 at the moment. 42? Okay, gang. I will stand by waiting. Pretty good score. So we've got a, a lot of low-code people that really enjoy it. And I, I have a lot of respect for parts of what low code is. And what I want to talk about today is some of the good and the bad and the ugly for that. So nice work there. Let's go with 24 people. Thank you, everyone there for jumping in and doing that. All right. So um, as pointed out in the introduction, how big is the low code market? I've got some more recent data. Um, it's actually in the last year alone, it has grown 22% in the last year alone, which is massive, uh, with a projected market total of $13.8 billion. Um, and as, as pointed out in the intro, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, companies uh, sort of into that space at the moment. So it's attracting a lot of attention. And I, I really like the fact that low code is getting a lot of attention because it's sort of like when the cloud first came out, everyone, and we we're all like, yeah, this is wonderful. Um, we've all been doing cloud type things for ages, but it pulled in a lot of attention uh, into into our sort of into in our industry in a way. So I feel low code has has built built a lot of sort of um, a good momentum inside. Um, even though people don't know it's sort of model driven engineering under the hood, uh, at least it's pulling in that sort of level of attention. So why is it so huge? And this is this is out to the audience. I want you guys to put it in there. Uh, money being the obvious one, uh, people want to make some money. But why is why is low code so huge? Just throw in your comments in there. Let's what see. Every, let's see what everybody says here. Yep, classic saves time. All right, we know from building applications how much of our code actually is. Let's call it boilerplate code. Domain user empowerment seems the shortcut. Great for lazy people. Uh, thank you for that person who wrote that comment. Um, I think developers, uh, I wouldn't call us inherently lazy, uh, but we're like water, we'll follow the path of least resistance. Uh, so in a way, lazy. Um, opening up development to a fringe population. Yep, agree on that one. Uh, Quickly, lots of speed things here. Um, let me scroll down here. Growing need for software. Yes, we are, as programmers, we are programming the pinnacle tool of our civilization. So humanity has built these amazing machines and we are the programmers that are able to control these things. So there is going to be a huge thirst for, for more and more programmers and code over the over the coming years. And I think we all know that. Uh, political tool like SAP needs that. Interesting. I'd love, I'd love to hear who actually put that comment, what they actually meant by that. If you feel confident enough to talk to that one, just take yourself off mute. Um, low tech entry, yes. So teaching, is this, uh, is low code, a possible nice way that entry level way so instead of us blowing our students out of the water with all these really complex you know concepts of meta models and model to text transformations and all these types of things is low code a nice entry way for us teaching um any other comments i was hoping someone might put uh quality i don't see a lot of quality uh type of comments on here uh, for me, a lot about software is not just about, you know, how fast we can do it, because ultimately, if everything is going about faster, and you're just going faster, and you're going faster, ultimately, where does that get us? Does that get us to a better place? I, I'd, I'd debate that. I would, I would say that uh, we need to um, look at the quality. Uh, interesting comment there. Yes, yes, very good. All good comments. I'll, I'll share. I'll share these um, afterwards. So we know why it's it's so huge. Now I found a, a report from Stripe. Uh, so Stripe is the um, the um, uh, payment gateway um, solution. It's huge, right? Absolutely massive. Um, this this report found that um, 
key senior executives put access to developers, so development, the ability to develop is a bigger risk than access to capital. So it's easier for these executives these days to find money than it is to find developers. Okay, now if you put yourself in the shoes of these big executives, right, and they're sitting there going, oh crap, right, I, 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 I'm in trouble, I need more development, I need, I need to innovate, I need to do all these amazing things, and that's one of their biggest key things, right? What they're gonna do is they're gonna look towards technologies like low code because they see that as sort of a, a bit of a holy grail, a way for us to um, empower the citizen developer. Okay, and this is this is the step, right? We've got all these people out there. Developers make up a very small part of the ecosystem. And what these senior executives and people want to do is they want to empower the entire organization. They're so worried about disruption and other industries and startups and all this type of thing to actually come through that that they that they they want to empower their citizens developers. There we go. It's a bit light. It just got dark here. By the way, I just noticed how dark my image had gone on the thing. The sun has just gone down here in Australia. Um, so they're so they're so worried about this that they want to empower these citizen developers uh, to do these types of things. And it's pretty cool. I actually I actually spend a, a lot of time. Like I have um, I employ a lot of designers so that do the user experience and this type of thing. And and they always say to me, Hey, Eben, everybody is a designer, and I love that. I think everyone is a designer. Right, and I also believe that everyone is a developer. They don't like that when I say that to them for whatever reason. Like, oh, everyone should be a developer. Everyone should be considered a developer. So I, I actually really advocate and like what the low code sort of momentum has done. Is it's put, it's sort of donned everyone. It's put, given people the hat and said, here you go. You, you can be a developer as well. Uh, and, and, and everyone across the organization is able to innovate. So that's that's powerful message. That's powerful stuff. And that's that's seen as big part of the, the low code community take off, which is awesome. Right? Now what but something happens in these in these low codes um, environments and I'm not gonna pick on any particular um, on any particular uh, uh, tool out there, but something happens right and and we've all been hopefully everyone here has been all part of what these um uh environments are sorry my my five-year-old daughter's just come out give me one sec <laughs> working from home <laughs> yeah <laughs> there we go COVID times um all right so so i'm asking everyone here so so we know what the good is what is the bad what is the bad that goes along with with this low code thing? And I, I use the metaphor of, of driving a car, right? We, 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 if we had a car, would we drive this car around in first gear? You know, no, no, we wouldn't want to drive this car around in first gear. Is low code the, the vision of what we all see with model driven engineering? Is low code the best that we can do? Um, as an area of expertise, is that as far as we go? Or are there problems within the low code uh, environment? And it's okay to call these things out. Yeah, it feels like VB6 on the web. Very good. Uh, VB6 was good for its time, I guess. Yes. <laughs> I like that. What is that stick makes a nasty noise. That's good. Yeah, so this is the, that's the classic, right? Lack of insight into the code. This is this is the this is the problem. And there's a there's a paradox that we should all be known of, known about, which actually uh, talks about that. Um, what are, what other what other things? Come on, gang! You've all used these different systems out there. What what is it you've looked at it and thought to yourself? How can how can I do this better? Or, or something that you sort of hit your butt up against. Yeah, security worries, excellent. Yeah, the difficulty in extending the apps. Very, very, very important. What else? It's not just about the code. What other things? Vendor lock-in. Yes, scalability. How do we scale these things? Yep. Uh, less documentation. 
Yeah, keep them coming, gang. Keep them going. Just whatever you got on your mind, put this in here because we're going to share this uh, to the entire workshop. We want everybody to be able to look at these things and actually know um, the different... The, whoosh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did we actually... What did I just do? Um... One of, one of mine is is how long it actually takes to learn these low code platforms. Like I'm I'm a pretty smart dude, um, but it like and they say citizen developers should be easy for them. Um, yeah, so you need to get started, get a new driving license for each platform. That's what I'm talking about there. Um, it's very it can be very limiting. Yes, yeah. Are we dumbing down a generation? So there's lots of things there. Yes, very good. Are we stunting technical? Mike said, use this snippet. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good one. I like that. All right, cool. Um, I'll leave it on that. That's, I think I think everyone's had a, enough there. We'll um, continue on. Thank you for sharing those. All right. So one of the things that everyone said about this, right, is low code, we can only use pre-built blocks. Okay, and what I mean by only use pre-built blocks is that we are limited to whatever the low-code platform can give us, right? And that is that as far as we can go. So if we want to innovate, okay, and I'm talking about true innovation, and we want to be we want to be champions of true innovation. We don't want to be locked into these these pre-built blocks. That's not what we want to do, right? Okay, so we all know that. Okay, so what happens is, okay, is that these these low code platforms they will say hey you can extend you can extend this here's the source code sometimes they give you the source code sometimes you have to pay a lot of money for the source code whatever but they give you different ways to do it and i won't again i'm not going to pick on any particular low code platform you might extend through maybe osgi you might actually get access to the source code you might actually add source code into the model itself um, there, there's lots of different ways that you can actually extend this, right? And, but but the point the point I'm trying to make is that when you've got these pre-built blocks, right? And that is as far as the citizen developers can go because that is their world. For them to go that extra bit, what needs to happen is we need professional developers again. Okay, so 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 we've gone full circle. Okay, we started off by saying, hey, we can't get enough professional developers. Let's empower the citizen developers. Then we send the citizen developers in. They can only go so far. And then and then we need the professional developers back in again. And then what happens is the professional developers lift up the hood of the engine. They look inside to see what's going on. And their, and their eyes start to water. Okay, we've all used some of this code that some of these uh, platforms come out with these these different things and it's just like it is it is horrible and every organization i have gone to i have not met many developers at all professional developers that are happy with a low code platform that they can customize okay oh, they're very very few and far between and that's something we need to address um uh, as a movement as part of model driven engineering all right um what has your experience been Okay, when you've gone to customize, what what has happened? Have you have you been able to reach your customization? Are you able to style these apps in a way that creates um, the look and feel that you're after? Are you able to extend and create your own intellectual property? What what has your experience been? Just throw throw them throw them in there. Um, I know there's a talk later on today. Um, I read it in at the beginning. There's a, there's a talk about an experience of building an app across multiple platforms. So it's going to be very interesting um, what actually uh, comes out in that talk today. Uh, actually, to save time, every yeah, every app looks the same. Yeah, th that's a classic. That that one here it takes just as long to learn the format as it would have been to just actually write the code. I hear that one so much. It's so difficult to customize, right? And and this this is this is the sentiment that's going across industry. It, the customer is not so cut de the dev tools are substandard. It is this is so this is this is the Achilles heel in low code, right? They've they've this is where 
actually there's a big part of the market i believe right now so low code is accelerating and it's getting bigger as ctos and, and those senior executives go, we need got low code we need low code we need all this right but there's actually those people that have been using it for a while are already going holy crap they've 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 reached in they've grabbed it and then they've realized this and go this is this is actually leading to a lot of things that we did not expect so there was a lot of unintentional consequences around that all right now what have we actually done we've lost control okay we've lost control and we are now at the mercy of the low code vendors and your professional developers are pushing back that's that's where we've ended up all right we must have control okay control for a software engineer is absolutely everything okay you must have control from top to bottom, from left to right, of everything that you're doing to be able to really get to true innovation. I'm talking about true innovation. I'm not talking about, you know, creating simple apps, you know, that just solve a very basic business problem. Yeah, maybe that's where low code will fit in the future to be able to do those basic things. I'm talking about leading to true innovation where you're doing something novel and new. All right, so what we need is we need three ingredients for success to make make this vision become a reality. We need people, we need processes, and we need tool. Okay, the first thing I want to do is I want to say a big thank you to all of those academics and lecturers and people on this call that are on the front line teaching the next generation. And I, I'd love to see that you're putting 15 PhD students uh, through some training and everything around this and bringing through that next wave. We need more people, okay? So we, we need to train more people up in model-driven engineering and we need to get more people excited about them, okay? That's the first thing, okay? And thank you to all those people on the front line actually um, training those people. Next thing we need is we need a process. And what I'm gonna to do today is I'm gonna I'm gonna show everyone here a process which we follow and some of the results that we've been able to achieve. Okay, I'm gonna show that. And we need some awesome tools. Okay, and every grand challenge I've ever read about model-driven engineering lists out we need better tooling. All right, the first tool I'm just gonna flick over and have a look at. I've used all sorts of model-driven tools over uh, my career. Um, but my favorite one uh, at the moment, um, hands down, is uh, this little guy here um, called Epsilon. Okay, I, I think Epsilon is an absolute cracker. Um, the thing I like about Epsilon the most, okay, is it's, it feels relatively light. Um, I can read the documentation, uh, really good documentation, by the way. Uh, I can read that and I can understand it. Okay, and it's got a full suite of things that I need to, to use as a model driven engineer. Okay, it's got all of them there. I'm just like, it's brilliant. And I've been, I've been using Epsilon now for quite some time and, and we're, we're all in on using Epsilon and supporting that um, as a platform. If you haven't seen it yet, this is a great little tool here um, that's available um, here in um, online and live. Um, the thing I love about uh, this uh, the most is it makes it really obvious to someone that I'm just quickly showing what model driven is, the various things that I need. Okay, first of all, I need a meta model and a model, two important things. Okay, the meta model is the key. If you don't control your meta model, okay, you are at the mercy of a vendor, and that is one of the downfalls of low code. Okay, because low code does not allow you to control the meta model. All right, so. Then you've got your model and then you've got some transformations up here and there's some nice little um, uh, transformations up here that you can just sort of uh, uh, click on to have a look at. So if we just go to uh, generate a, a Gantt chart um, and I know there's uh, everyone has seen this uh, and you hit this little play button here and you go here's the EGL. Yep, uh, explaining, as soon as you explain to a software engineer that a template, you've been doing templating all your life um, as a software engineer, it's just like templating from the early days um, of you know PHP programming, if you like. Uh, as soon as you explain that to a software engineer, um, they, they, their fear around model-driven 
um, is is put to the side. It, it becomes whatever. Like, oh, this is familiar. I, yeah, yeah, man. It's it's all good. Templating. You got loops, and they go, oh yeah, I know loops. Um, we've got selection statements. We've got all variables. All these things, and they start to become comfortable very quick. And then you click the little thing, and over here you've got some generated stuff. And again controlling the meta model here and the model and everything around this is a, it's an amazing little platform so well done to uh, i know there's a few people on this uh, call that have worked on epsilon uh, over their career uh, and thank you and well done to you guys uh, for an amazing tool keep up the good work um when i'm a, a huge success um i'll make sure that um everything uh comes your way that's uh, deservingly so all right what do we need control of Okay, now this is an important point. Okay, so on the right hand side, we've got we want to be in the driver's seat, we need total control of these things. On the left hand side, we need to be a passenger, we don't need control of any of the any of these things. Okay, do we need control of our source code? Okay, when building stuff, do we need control of our models? Do we need control of our meta models? Do we need control of our templates? Okay, and do we need control of our transformations? They, they're the main, the main. I don't know what the right word is, but they're the main sort of categories, if you like, of things that we do in the model-driven world. Okay, what do we actually need control of here? All right, let's see how the votes go. Very high. Meta models is right up there. That's awesome. Source code, interesting. Templates is making a, a comeback. I'd love to. I'd love to learn why people do not believe that they need control of the source code. That one. That's Demetrius. That's an. That's an interesting one. Um, that I think is worth. Um, oh no, it's it's making a comeback. <laughs> uh, that's an interesting one. That I think it's worth actually thinking about. Um, there we go. So source code. So it's starting to settle down as we're getting all the votes. Um, coming in now. Um, great to see that everybody recognizes how important it is to control your meta model. Um, it's one of one of the bits that I believe uh, low code platforms um, are very difficult, and how we get stuck in first gear is because in those platforms we cannot we cannot control the meta model, uh, which is um, well, if you can, it's it's on a very limited uh, basis what we're actually after. All right, cool. I think we got a good sample size there. All right, now, um, the, talking about the process, how do you actually follow a process to do this? Like, I know I'm gonna run out of time here, so I'm not gonna go into the details of this flow chart, okay? But this flow chart um, is actually in the introduction of my PhD. So if you look up Eben Escott and look at me on publications and stuff and, and look at my PhD, this is actually the flow chart from my PhD. And I'm proud to report um, since graduating um, a decade ago and going on this journey of taking this technology and these ideas further, um, we've been following this flow chart and we've created um, lots of different bots. Um, all sorts of different code bots. So bots, I, um, if you like, you can call, you can think, when I say a bot, you can think of an agent or you can think of an algorithm or you can think of whatever you want. We just call them code bots because I love talking about augmented intelligence and, and really cool future stuff like that. I like to think of a bot sitting there next to me as I'm coding and, and the bot does lots of the heavy lifting for me. So we call, call them code bots. So we follow this process and we've developed lots of different code bots um, over, over the years. Um, we've, we've developed a bot that works inside um, the defense network here in Australia. Uh, we've, we've built bots that um, have helped startups with IoT platforms. Um, we've built bots that do all sorts of amazing things. Um, and it's all done by just um, following this process. Um, down in the left hand, uh, in the right hand corner here, you can see we got App Studio. Um, think of App Studio like your traditional low code. Uh, that's where you go and manipulate your models. You hit the build button. The bots write the code, and and that that code gets committed to a Git repository. Okay, and you take that away. The AI lab, which I'm going to show you guys a video of shortly. It only goes for three minutes. Um, I'm going to talk to it. This is the new U Butte shiny thing. 
Um, so I've developed um, a patented technology um, where you can actually train a bot to code in any technology stack. Uh, and I'm gonna show you guys today uh, a world first on that, which is uh, pretty exciting, uh, which I'm gonna play a video. Um, but that's the AI lab, is how you actually train the bot up over here, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, and we're gonna look at that shortly. Um, uh, the next thing was, and I'm running out of time, um, how much long have I got? Like about 10 minutes? Is that okay? Yep. 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 10 minutes. Okay. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, this, this video here, I'll flick over. Um, this video here is the app studio, um, video. Uh, I'll just fast forward and we won't watch the full two minutes to save some time. Basically when you create an app, you choose a bot, uh, in this case here at C sharp bot. Uh, then you come across to the actual studio here, uh, and then you can diagram or, or model your actual application. Uh, and we've built this really cool uh, modeling tool. Um, and you can create any type, because you've got control of the meta models, you can create any type of diagram. This bot here takes three uh, diagrams, entity, user interface, and security. Um, once you've modeled up your application, I'll just fast forward through all this. There's the security diagram, pretty cool. Um, then you watch the bots write code. Uh, so this is the best progress bar in history. Uh, we call it the fireworks. Uh, and this is the bots actually writing the code real time up in the cloud. Um, this bot here, blues the server side, uh, yellow nodes here in the tree structure, are the client side source code files and the uh, red ones here um, are your testing. So the bots wrote, write both the development target and the testing target. And then you get a full stack application um, and that's committed to our customers um, source code repository. So they have full control of their source code and the source code looks like a bot, uh, sorry, a developer has written it. And you can see here, and we just use uh, the Epsilon tooling around the protected regions. Um, so there's protected regions alongside the developer readable source code where developers can come in and add their custom code. Um, it's, it's, it's beautiful to see and it's, it's great to see um, lots of people using the App Studio today. Now, uh, to the exciting bit quickly, this is the AI lab. Um, JG, give us a drum roll. There we go. <laughs> Ta-da. Ta-da. Okay, here we go. All right, super, super quick, gang. I'm sure there's going to be questions afterwards. So here's the AI lab. Uh, we take a code first approach. So you have to train it up on a code base or so something you've written first. What we've actually started with is using a code generator from a well-known framework, in this case, Nest.js, and it's a CRUD code generator. We've done it for Spring and we've done it for Ruby on Rails and we're looking at other code generators, but we can train a bot to write um, this code uh, based on what comes out of uh, these code generators. It's gonna be really interesting where this goes uh, with legacy systems as well. So you create your new bot. You can call your bot whatever you wanna call it. This one's called demo bot. Uh, and then you copy that source code from the code generator into the Git repository for it to actually um, understand what's um, going on. Um, once you've got that, the next thing you've got to give the bot two things before it starts to learn. So you give it the source code. You can see here's all the source code. Um, that's just a Git diff. Uh, so you can see everything on the right of the Git diff is new because it's whatever. Um, the next thing you've got to do for the bot is give it the corresponding model. In this case, the input to uh, this particular code generator was a dog and a human, uh, and you give it the input model. And then the last thing you do is you link up which model elements relate to uh, which files. I know how we can get around, so we don't need to do the linking step, but at the moment, we're just doing this manually for the moment. Once that's done, uh, you hit the start learning and then the learn uh, kicks off in the background. Instead of watching the learn, I think this learn takes about 30 seconds. I cut the video short here and you can see here it is, the bot's gone ahead and learnt the templates. So this particular learn cycle got 100% match. Um, so these templates match 100% uh, to what the actual ref reference application was. Um, and just to show you um, that that's all correct, um, and what we do is we put the templates 
the target, the reference, the models, including the meta model, and all the experiments that, that you run into a Git repository. So we give our customers everything, okay? There's nothing hidden away. There's no vendor lock-in. It's all there for you guys to use and, and create some amazing things um, and use the platform to do it. And as you can see here, we come into the templates and Demetrius, how cool is this? Here's an EGL template that the bot learned to represent the controller inside a Nest.js um, full stack application. Pretty proud of that one. I know you're all, all applauding. You just got yourselves on mute. That's fine. <laughs> um, okay. Um, it is really cool. Thank you. Um, custom code. Um, we, we've experimented just one last point and I'm going to open up to some questions and some comments. Um, custom code, the protected regions work really well. Demetrius, when we get a chance to catch up, I've got, we've actually come up with a new way where we actually can get rid of the, the comments of protected regions and we can start doing that. I'm happy to share that with you. And then it just cleans up the code because we get some comments from some of people saying, hey, this code looks terrible because it's got all these protected region comments in there. That's the only negative thing to it, but we've devised a way we can get rid of that, um, which I'm happy to contribute to Epsilon. Um, finally, um, what can be achieved um, when we got this level of control? Um, I use the classic image here um, of Earthrise. Um, we can, what we can achieve is DevOps, okay? And I believe DevOps has got a huge um, future uh, to what we need to do uh, across our industry completely. We can allow our senior developers to set the standards in AI lab and, and have our citizens developers build what they need to inside App Studio and then, and then other developers extend naturally off the source code as you actually have control of that source code. And one of the most exciting things where this actually takes us now is into model-driven tool chains. Um, JG, who's my head of R&D, just give a little wave. JG did the drum roll for me before. Uh, and Sam, who's part of the R&D team, she's on the call as well. Um, we've, we're writing a paper at the moment, which we're going to publish later this year and show you guys, everyone here, um, how you actually use tools, um, model-driven tools inside tool chains, inside DevOps. And for us, that's a big future of what we need to do uh, inside our industry. Um, special offer uh, for everyone, jump on cobots.com, book a meeting and let's talk if you want to have a look at it. Um, and that's the end of the official... Um, 45 minutes, which I, I, I've i finished three minutes early. Sorry, I went a little bit over time. Uh, but let's let's um, open up to um, any questions that um, people have. Uh, okay, great. Thank you very much, Evan. Um, questions from our audience? Can I? Yeah, please go ahead, David. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Evan, for your uh, great talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, but I, mean, I, I think that I need to do a provocative, provocative uh, question here. In the sense that uh, you remember then, uh, maybe 10 years or even 15 years ago, uh, when uh, we were presenting model-driven engineering, at the end we were given too much emphasis on model-driven development in the sense that on code generations uh, uh, apart, no, on generating code. So, And we were presenting, you know, people were more presenting you know, the possibility of generating the source code from UML diagrams, for instance. Yeah. And this was the main selling point. And in my opinion, that was a, a big mistake because model driven engineering is not only that. Now, if you keep presenting these low code development platforms as a way to generate uh, so 100% of source code, maybe we are doing the same mistake. What do you think? It's, it's a good point. And, and UML um, is a good example um, for our industry, right? We, we all live through that, that era um, of what's actually going on. Um, I, think, I, think it was, I think UML was, was close, but it, it missed a few key points. Um, the, the, it, it, it became too heavyweight um, and people didn't feel like they controlled the meta model. So we ended up with some very, very um, heavyweight models um, which were, were quite difficult to use, and you spend a lot of time teaching people what these models are. Um, I like I like um, the approach um, that sort of says, "Hey, let's not let's not start with a, a standard like UML. Let's just model just enough, just enough for what we need to represent what we're after." 
Okay, so it's sort of that almost like a lazy load sort of approach, and then and then then the models become um, far simpler. Um, the big the other big problem that we did during that era is that what the source code and this is the problem with low code as well. In some ways, your low code is just UML rewrapped as something new, right? Is that the source code that comes out of those tools, the code generation part of it? The source code came out was a black box. It was a black box, and as developers, we'd be like, "Oh, that's horrible. What do we, what do we actually do with that code?" So what what I'm suggesting to everyone is we flip that. Okay, we go with what I call a code first approach. And I went, I skipped over that flow chart from my PhD um, too quickly. But the idea is, is the first thing we do is we write the source code. Okay, so so we don't take any power or control away from software developers. Remember, that's what we want to do. We want to keep the control with the software developers. If as soon as we take control away from them, they're going to be peed off at us. Okay, they don't like us. Yep. So we need to give them control. So the way to give them control is to flip it and say, you write the code first, so you set the standard. You you write it in whatever architectural style you want, whatever framework, whatever. We don't care as model driven engineers. We don't care. You you go ahead and do that. Now, then we use these lightweight models sitting alongside those. What is the minimum amount of model and meta model that we can do to actually represent that bit of code that we've done? Right now, from there, traditionally manually, we we would then go ahead and make those templates. We would because we're very good at templating and we've been doing it a long time, we could then manually write our model to text or model to model transformations and we'd do that, right? What we've done at CodeBots is we've just gone a little bit different and we said, you know what? We actually don't need to write those templates. A, a bot can learn that. And so we've, we've shortcutted the whole thing. So, so that, that allows developers to actually be able to, to have that level of control that they're after. So I think UML was close. It just went. It just. It just went down the wrong path. So we just needed. We just need to reverse up, change a few parameters of what we're doing, and and re-engage. Okay. Thank you. I think Jern wants to add something to that, or to answer another uh, question. I just pay. I just put in a um, um, a link in the chat. So there is this old Dilbert cartoon where um, you see Booch sitting at the table and he's talking about abstraction of abstraction of abstraction, and then. Dogbird walks in and he goes, uh, the monster is dispatched uh, to the dark world by the side of its feared object, actual code. And that's what we meet in practice. Um, if we start a conversation with somebody who's got their head down between two JavaScript functions and you tell them about meta models, um, what you get is a shrug generally. You can only uh, show them that 50% to 70% of the page will be done automatically and with no typos, then you catch their attention. And that's why templates and generating source code is still very much part of the conversation as a starter. We don't want it as a continuity, but we want it as a starting point. Um, yeah, good point. Other questions? Just mentioning templates, Eugene has a question in the, in the, has put a question in the chat about the uh, the fact that there are different strategies for integrating handwritten and generative code and why are protected regions uh, the the approach you have opted for? Yeah, yeah, good good question. Thank thank you for that. Um, at some at some point you're gonna have to have the software developer write code alongside the generated code. It, it's gonna have to happen at some point. Um, I've seen efforts uh, where um, and and um, a big um, boo to Martin Fowler, um, who was saying that you should never commit generated code into a Git repository. And so we, we the industry spent years um, sort of saying, no, you should never commit generated code because Martin Fowler said it without actually us thinking about it. Um, but it doesn't work because you get all these weird extension and different types of things. What we want to do is we want to treat the bot as just another developer who's just writing code for us. Yeah, and they're pushing and pulling to the Git repository exactly like any other coder does. And then we just need a nice way to be able to work out which is the bit the bot's written or code generated, if you like, and which is the bit the developer's written. And the protected region, the code comments, is just a nice 
um, sort of marker to say, here's the two comments here. You write your code here. Everything outside of those protected regions uh, is code generated or, or bot written, if you like. Uh, so it's a it's a nice it's a nice way to actually do it. Mm -hmm. um, Gabi has a question. Yeah, there's a question uh, where I want to um, uh, report uh, shortly about um, an experience we did, we had, and uh, ask your opinion about that. Um, we ran a seminar on low code platforms and we considered two commercial ones and two um, open source uh, platforms. And uh, the outcome of the student seminar was uh, that the commercial ones were easy to use and uh, they were um, able to, to build some, some usable apps, but uh, um, um, open source um, platforms were not easy to use and they had a lot of troubles. Um, what is your experience about that? Yeah, the poor, the poor open sources don't have enough money. <laughs> 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 basically what it comes you know what i mean and a lot of a lot of them are contributing uh you know through the goodness of their heart and you know while they're working full time and everything around that it's it's a, it's absolutely ridiculous how much some of these loco platforms have been able to raise as well i'm not going to name names but you know we're talking into the hundreds of millions of dollars you know uh they're raising and spending on a, a big portion of that on their on their actual platform so uh, yeah, um, well funded is what I would say uh, at this point in time. Yeah, but also the design was quite different. Yeah, yeah the the um, the the sort of the commercial vendors have gone with sort of a high fidelity approach where it's almost like a Squarespace or a Wix, you know what I mean, where you jump on and you're designing the app. Uh, the model looks exactly like the app's going to look. So, which I find weird as a as a as a, a modelist because the whole point of a model is it's supposed to be more abstract than the thing that we're actually modeling. Um, but what they've actually the low code vendors do is they actually make these models, especially of the user interface, that um, look like the final app, and they spend a, a spend a lot of money on actually doing that. Um, so I'm not surprised they had a good experience of building like a little basic app. Uh, because they can just basically, you know, do a drag and drop, connect a few pages together, and they get something pretty good out of the box for a simple application. And, and you'll find that. I've actually shot a couple of videos and just showed how to build lots of Hello World programs in these these types of uh, commercial low-code tools. Um, and, that's, and that's the first bit of innovation they get to, but that's where it stops. And that's the, I guess, the point I was trying to make when they want to truly innovate and they want to go further, then they got to get into the into the bottom of the beast, so to speak, and try and customize the thing. And that's where the pain comes. And then we go, we end up in that circle that we're actually after. Yeah, we did that experience. Um, <laughs> but even when going further, also the, the open source platforms were very, very difficult to use. And um, yeah, yeah. I, I, with help of developers, uh, it was possible to. to yeah, I agree. In the end. I agree. And and the the trick is, and if you ever look at Codebots, you'll you'll see uh, what I call it a code first approach. So so what we always do is we always start by writing the reference application first. Um, so and that's what you train the bot on. So when you teach like when you're teaching a child how to do something new, um, this is how you kick a soccer ball. I put the soccer ball on the ground and I show how to do it. You know, I, 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 I show what they're going to do. It's same when you treat a code bot. So what we're able to do is because we do this code first approach and that's what you train the bot up on when when you when you look into into what's actually behind there inside the Git repository, you come across code that looks like a developer has written it because that's what the bot has actually learnt off and that's one of the tricks and that's the that's one of the parts of my phd which is held true uh to this day uh and that's that's published and and we've been able to collect a lot of data around that uh which is cool oh right, here's a here's a cool stat i didn't um throw over to you following following this process and we've built hundreds um uh, actually thousands of these apps now through our platform. Um, we've found that um, the average is um, just under 93% uh, of a source code base 
can be written by a bot and the other 7% by a human. Um, sometimes for basic apps, um, which, you know, aren't that sort of revolutionary, they just do, you know, your standard forms, workflows, timelines, all those types of things that you'd expect from a low-code platform. Sometimes you can get 98, 99% uh, bot written and higher, uh, but on average we get about 93% uh, percent of an application can be written by a bot. That leads to speed, quality and, and reuse, uh, which is pretty cool. Thank you. No worries. Got to, As scientists, we have to collect data along our journey. I'm happy, if anyone wants any of the data, I'm happy to share. Great. Uh... Thank you very much, Eben. Uh, let's give Eben a round of applause. Physical or virtual. Uh, um. <laughs>